top of the morning to you and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Olumide Macaulay. The headlines. Kiev official named a suspect in bomb shelter death probe. EU leaders call on China to help stop Ukraine war. Plus, Russia accuses Ukraine of planning missile strikes on Crimea. Thank you for joining us. Prosecutors have served a notice of suspicion on the head of Kiev's municipal department for security after three people died in a Russian air attack when they were trying to gain access into a bomb shelter to which they could not. The victims had rushed to the shelter that failed to open. Now their deaths on June the 1st caused public outrage and prompted Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky to promise a harsh response. According to the prosecutor's office, the suspect was accused of improperly performing official duties and his lack of control over the maintenance and readiness of city bomb shelters leading to death and injury. Meanwhile, a woman is being killed in a Ukrainian drone attack and four people wounded in the Russian-controlled town of Novakakovka. That's according to local Russian-appointed authorities. Nova Kokovka is a city in Kherson province and the site of the dam breach that caused widespread flooding this month along the Dnipro River. EU leaders are planning to call on China next week to help bring an end to the war in Ukraine, engage in global challenges such as climate change as well as rebalance economic relations with the European Union. EU leaders will meet for a summit in Brussels between June 29th and the 30th with China and economic security amongst the main topics. The call on China to set out in draft conclusions prepared ahead of the summit and that could still change. Now, a top EU official says that the draft conclusions are in line with a group of seven declaration from May, but with more specific EU-China issues, such as rebalancing the economy, the economic relations, and the need for reciprocity. Also, the European Union's chief executive, Ursula von der Leyen, has unveiled an aid package for Ukraine worth 50 billion euros, or 54 $0.65 billion. The figure comes after a review of the bloc's 2021 to 2027 budget and ahead of an international conference in London this week aimed at raising more funds to rebuild Ukraine from its war with Russia. In remarks to journalists after an EU Commission meeting in Brussels, von der Leyen says the 50 billion euro budget reserve will provide perspective and reliability to the bloc's Ukrainian partners. On Ukraine, here we propose a financial reserve for the next four years of 50 billion euro. This includes both loans and grants. The preserve will provide, first of all, perspective for our partners in Ukraine, predictability. And it should also incentivize other donors to step up too. We are here proposing to equip our member states with financial support to strengthen the management of our external border. We need to work more intensively with our neighborhood to foster their economic development, to stabilize those countries. We need to enhance our international partnership. And therefore, we need additional budget for Syrian refugees in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and in Turkey for the southern migration route, for the Western Balkans, for the partners across the world, and also to maintain our capacity to react to humanitarian crises and natural disasters. For all of this, what I've just described, we are asking for 15 billion euro, one five. We expect with leveraging and crowding in of private capital, this is crucial, 
that this will re result in an investment capacity of 160 billion euro for step. With this overall revision of the MFF, we are asking our 27 member states to equip us with 66 billion euro to deliver on these three priorities I've just described, Ukraine, migration and competitiveness. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Zelensky is claiming that Ukraine's forces are destroying Russian forces in the two main theaters of conflict, the east and the south of the country. Referring to a conference to take place in London on post-war recovery, President Zelensky says rebuilding Ukraine was a vehicle and a guarantee of security and a means of protection against any repetition of Russian aggression. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu is claiming that Ukraine is planning to attack Moscow-controlled Crimea with HIMARS long-range artillery systems and storm shadow missiles and warning that Russia will retaliate. Video and the text of his statement have been released on Russian Defense Ministry website and social media. Such strikes, which Russia considers to be outside the area of what it calls its special military operation in Ukraine, would also mean full-scale involvement of the United States and Britain in the conflict, according to President to Shogu. Over in Britain, King Charles III hosted state officials and diplomats at St. James Palace on Tuesday, ahead of the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London. The two-day conference starts today and will focus on building international support for Ukraine's recovery from the war. More than 1,000 foreign officials from over 60 states, along with business chiefs and global investors, are attending. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly visited the Ukrainian Welcome Center in London yesterday. They also lit candles at the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Cathedral as they listened to the singing choir. They also got to know more about the work of the Center for Ukrainian Refugees and visited one of the lessons. Blinken is in London to attend the Ukraine Recovery Conference. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says he will set out a new assistance package for Ukraine. He said this today as he addressed the conference aimed at encouraging private companies to invest in the country's reconstruction after Russia's invasion. Kiev and London are hosting the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London. Both foreign ministers underlined the conference as focusing on encouraging the private sector to use its resources to help speed Ukraine's reconstruction but that Kyiv had to do its part by pressing on with reform and the world had to figure out a way to offer in companies insurance against war damage and destruction. Ukraine is seeking up to $40 billion to fund the first part of the Green Marshall Plan, as it's called, to rebuild its economy, including developing a coal-free steel industry. The total bill will be huge with Ukraine, the World Bank, the European Ladies Commission you and the United Nations much. estimating in March that the cost was $411 billion for the first year of the war. It will easily reach more than $1 trillion. President Biden said from the outset of Russia's aggression against Ukraine that we would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes, and both of our countries are deeply committed to that. Uh, we will continue to deliver on that commitment, uh, including through uh, a new robust U.S. assistance package that I'll be able to announce tomorrow. As I said, the, the, the flip side of this is um, all the work that we are doing here to help Ukraine prepare for having uh, the strongest possible economy, the strongest possible democracy, which is actually necessary to achieve a, a thriving economy and for reconstruction. If Ukraine is going to attract the investment it's going to need, uh, not just from governments, not just from international financial institutions, but from the private sector, it has to build the best possible environment to attract that investment. Uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, Secretary General of, uh, of NATO, 
Uh, no, we have not. We're not um, pushing, promoting any uh, particular candidate. We're in very uh, close consultation with our allies and partners uh, to uh, uh, to determine where we want to go uh, with uh, with NATO and its leadership. This week is very much about creating the conditions necessary for um, uh, public sector money, of course, but predominantly private sector money to fund their reconstruction. Now, the precise details of how we do that, uh, I don't want to prejudge. The whole point of the next couple of days is that uh, the UK uses its expertise as a global financial services uh, centre, including as a, a global insurance centre, but also our convening power. Uh, we want to ensure uh, that the investment that goes into Ukraine uh, is safe, safe from further uh, conflict uh, and deployed as effectively as possible through robust and reformed Ukrainian institutions. Now we're pleased to talk to Nigeria's former ambassador to Switzerland, Ambassador Joseph Fayalogu, speaking to us from London. It's good to have you with us on the program this morning, sir. Well, good morning, Olamide. Olamide. Okay, let's get to it. Ambassador, um, the Poles did it, the Polish did it, in Warsaw after World War II. One only has to take a look at the devastation that happened in just that neck of the woods in Poland to see what they had to contend with for reconstruction. Now, if you look at Bakhmut in 2023, you see similarities between what happened in Warsaw and what happened in Bakhmut. But Bakhmut is not the only area that is suffering from devastation. The, the, Kakovka Dam that was uh, destroyed and the large swathes of land inundated with water is just another environmental disaster, obviously bringing up that bill, as we've been reporting, to $40 billion. As these countries come together in London this week for the conference, uh, it must be uh, cherry for the Ukrainians to know that these plans are being put in place for their recovery after the war. Your thoughts? Yeah, um, well, uh, I, it's quite interesting. Uh, it hap it's happened before. Um, uh, European countries are, are, ha are lucky they have people to help them uh, recover from wars, you know. We have an example of the Marshall Plan. So, um, and of course, we can see that a lot of sentiments here too to... For, uh, in favor of uh, Ukraine, uh, I am sure uh, there's no doubt that this drive for post reconstruction would attract a lot of support. Um, well, uh, I, uh, my, my, our con my concern, and I think that's the concern of everybody, is that uh, something is done to come bring the war to an end, because if the, war, the more it progresses and continues, uh, the, 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 the more the damage you have to, to face during the reconstruction, uh, it becomes higher. So a lot more effort should be put on uh, how to really bring the war to an end. What's your opinion, Ambassador, about uh, those calling for in the post-conflict era of this Ukraine war, saying that Russia should be made to pay war reparations? Oh, uh, that, that would be good. Uh, Germany Jam, uh, was, uh, was made to pay some reparations, both after the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, it would be a good thing to, to do, to achieve. Uh, of course, Russia would resist it. But uh, the, the, the global system, if they, they work hard at it, know how to, to, to get that to happen. Um, well, in the past, there has been, the, the, the situation has been different. Either uh, the aggressor was actually defeated to, uh, and uh, during the peace negotiations or the settlements, it becomes something that they are bound to do. So it all depends on how the war really ends, the crisis really ends. Russia's war chief, uh, Sergei Shogu, says that there's a threat 
a possibility that Ukraine will be attacking Crimea. And it says that they, they intend to use, they have intelligence to the effect that they intend to use HIMARS and storm shadow missiles, and that if they do that, they do attack Crimea, it will bring for them, for Russia, the Great Britain and the United States into the war. If you look at the missiles, it's talking about the storm shadow missiles that were made, uh, uh, developed by the French and the British. So mm. why, why is uh, Shogu saying that it's the United States and Britain that will be dragged into this war? Do you think this is poking the bear uh, if they attack Crimea? Well, well let, let, let's, let's be realistic. Crimea is not Russia. Crimea is Ukrainian uh, territory. And you, uh, the Ukrainian forces would be, uh, Ukrainian government would be hoping that one day they would, as part of settling this crisis, they would get back uh, Crimea. So, um, Shoigu uh, thinks that if uh, the, the, the Ukrainian forces uh, attack Crimea, uh, that that would drag uh, other parties into the war. Well, they can have the opinion on it, but the point is, Crimea itself is is Russian territory. So, uh, sorry, yeah, Crimea itself is Ukrainian territory, not Russia. Russia is just forcibly placing itself there. So Ukraine really has a legal right, justification to try to recover Crimea. For those that argue on the part, on the side of Russia concerning Crimea, since you've, uh, you've focused on that for the instance, let's do that for a second. One of the issues, the bones of contention that President Putin and some Russians have with that issue, and it goes as far back as the USSR and Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin, they said mm -hmm. that prior to the annexation of Crimea by Russia, that there was, a ref there was no referendum for the people in Crimea, whether they wanted to be part of Ukraine or Russia before the, before the separation of Ukraine from the USSR and the defunct USSR. So that referendum that they conducted after it was annexed or maybe sometime during that period was, according to the Russians, a true reflection of the Crimean people that they want to be a part of Russia and not Ukraine. Is there any truth in that argument? Well... Uh, Russia comes with all these arguments. The fact is that there has there's always been some territorial situations in the past, but after the Second World War, it was agreed that that all uh, that the territories should remain as they are, and that's what we've been working with. And for a long time, it, uh, we know that uh, Crimea. Uh, is Ukrainian. Of course, Crimea has always been changed hands. It, at the time, it was even a Turkish, you know, um, and so on. And history also tells us that uh, Russia deliberately infiltrated Crimea with a lot of Russians to 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 dis, 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 uh, distort the the population structure. So, what are we? What do we have to deal with? Uh, I see De definitely. Yeah. Right, I see your point. So that's a moot issue for both parties. Now, the relocation or the deployment of some tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus seems to have President Lukashenko of Belarus very happy about it. His body language is joyous that he has these tactical, tactical nuclear weapons. I like, we'd like for you to give us uh, an understanding and more clarity on why these weapons are such a threat in Belarus for the United States, for which President Joe Biden has said that it's irresponsible of Russia to do that. However, let's remember that there are about four countries hosting nuclear weapons from the United States. The United States is the only country that has nuclear weapons outside its territory in certain countries, including Germany. They're hosting uh, weapons. So Russia is saying what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Even though this is a war situation, Russia is, giving, is, is having Belarus host its nuclear weapons. If the United States can get away with it, why can't Russia? 
Well, that's a new argument. The point is that there has been a trend about uh, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, yes. of course, captured in the treaties that we have. Uh, the argument is that the less, even though we know that the number of countries have uh, nuclear capacity and all that, but the less we have them, the better for world peace. So when you now, in a way, nuclearize a non-nuclear country, you are expanding the, uh, the, the, the horizon of uh, nuclear capacitated, capacity country. So that's the fear. Um, and of course, well, putting them very close to uh, Ukraine, of, uh, is rather meant really to threaten Ukraine. I don't think that threatens uh, US and all that. It threatens Ukraine, it makes the crisis a bit difficult. Of course, we know why Lukashenko is accepting to have a nuclear bases in the territory, because uh, we will say bets of the same feather, that he has the same problem with Putin anyway, uh, dictatorship and all that. You, uh, you, you, you. I'm sure. I'm sure the ordinary Belarusian would prefer to get the outer, not to not to be part of this war. But yeah. Lukashenko has been there uh, for uh, well, doesn't uh, doesn't brook any opposition or any any uh, any other opinion about his uh, both his stay in office and every other thing he does. Uh, so he, he just plays plays the game for for Putin uh, as a surrogate uh, attack uh, well attack dog for uh, what's uh, you, uh, Ukraine I would say. Are you concerned about these nuclear weapons before we leave that? Um, let's put it in in a, in a in a wider context for the for more clarity or another perspective for our viewers of the 193 or 95 countries in the world, only nine have nuclear weapons. And of that nine that have nuclear weapons, including Pakistan and, um, and Israel and other countries, in the United States and Russia have 90% of these nuclear weapons. And of that 90%, most of it belongs to Russia, although um, the United States is coming a close second. Now, these tactical nuclear weapons have been described as, oh, they are tactical nuclear weapons, they're not the real McCoy, but these weapons in Belarus now, we're told that they have a yield, explosive yield of about 300 kilotons. To put that into perspective, what destroyed Hiroshima was 15 kilotons and 70,000 people died. So Belarus, Mr. Lukashenko has in his kitty now, some weapons that can that have the explosive yield of 300 kilotons. And if 15 kilotons destroyed Hiroshima, then we can understand how dangerous these weapons are. Is there a, a more concern, and should countries be also be showing more concern about these deployments of these weapons and not sweep it under the carpet? Because that's what it seems like people are doing. Well, yes, I, I think... Definitely, there should be a lot of worry. Um, it's already known that uh, the, that uh, nuclear is a mass killer. Uh, let, let me use that cliche. So there's no doubt about uh, what nuclear uh, uh, weaponry can do. And uh, it's a problem, again, when it gets into so many hands. Uh, you didn't mention North Korea. Yes, and uh, especially, especially countries that uh, don't care a damn about <laughs> about about what they can do or not do. So that that's part of the problem. Um, I I work at the UN, you know, and we, we, we there was a lot of effort in uh, nuclear non-proliferation, and that's the trend. The the reason being that. Uh, it's a dangerous weapon to have. It uh, it can even even a country, whatever they have now, can destroy half of the world. Indeed. Yeah. So so uh, we, we we should be concerned. We what we are looking for is 
an attempt to, uh, to, uh, to, to reduce or prevent or stop proliferation totally. And even countries that have it now, you either get them to destroy them like uh, some of African countries, I mean, like Ukraine, much earlier was encouraged to hand over its arsenals to, to Russia. Uh, they, are, they, 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 they are being to reduce the number of countries that have them and gradually only have nuclear on for, for, for technical and civil purposes. But definitely watched very carefully with regard to their use and, uh, and weaponization. Our president, Bola Tinubu, is in France at the moment uh, for reasons outside the Ukraine conflict, obviously to promote Nigeria's interests by way of business and trade. But bringing France into the picture and Emmanuel Macron at the beginning, as I've posited prior to this, France was very, very keen on preventing this war. Now, Emmanuel Macron is saying that the counteroffensive must work and uh, you, uh, Russia must be pushed back. It seems that France has cut off any ties with Russia, even though Emmanuel Macron was in Moscow to speak with President Putin person to person before the war. What do you think caused this total departure from France on any mediation with, with Russia? And is this good for international um, politics? Well, I, I think we discussed it sometime, well, something similar. Anyway, yeah. the point is there has been a serious effort for the past one year to convince, cajole, well, slightly threaten Russia into, you know, stopping the so-called uh, special, uh, uh, special action, well, which is another cliche for war. Uh, it, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising that out of sheer exasperation that a countries like uh, uh, France that has put quite a lot of effort into getting, uh, uh, got, getting Putin to, to desist from his path of aggression would begin to feel, look, it's not getting anywhere. It is almost like, uh, and France has a, a history of relations with Germany. It's almost like uh, trying to encourage Hitler to, 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 to stop his aggression in Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my answer to what could be the reason for any change. Yeah, there's uh, one year is enough for anybody to feel that there isn't any change in the peace efforts, in the appeasement effort uh, uh, to encourage uh, Putin on, on his own to put an end to this uh, crisis. Speaking of putting an end to the crisis, um, in the, the United States, the key ally of Ukraine in this matter, and possibly the country that has pumped more money into the defense of Ukraine more than any other, is facing an election next year where it's either going to be Joe Biden, who is a key uh, Ukraine ally, or it's going to be the, the Republicans with Donald Trump if he survives the indictment he's just had to undergo, becoming a cat with nine lives. If he survives that, then he's the strongest Republican candidate. Now, this same person, uh, former President Donald Trump, just about two days ago or yesterday was saying that he was doubling down on his claim that if he does ascend to power again in the United States, he'll end the war in 24 hours. So, yeah, he well, says that, and he um, keeps saying that. And he says that the deterrence, that why Putin did not invade Russia, uh, Ukraine before, was because of his diplomacy. Well, Trump seems to know a lot more than many others, many of us don't know. I, I wonder how he can encourage or force Putin um, to stop the war within 24 hours or not to have gone to war in the first place. So, 
Maybe that's part of his problem about this. Uh, there, there's, been, there's been this indication that he has a special relationship with Putin, uh, at times uh, considered to be inimical to U.S. interests. But th this is... Uh, um, but back to the election, it's still about one year away. Uh, it could go either way. Uh, President Putin, pre sorry, President Trump is facing some criminal charges. Yeah. Uh, even though it is said at times that that seems to be helping his case in terms of attracting, uh, uh, well, grassroots uh, support. I doubt. I don't know how that happens. Um, whether that uh, whether the U.S. would prefer to put a criminal. Well, somebody with some um, uh, charges uh, as president, that's, a, that, that's of course an internal uh, business. But um, it's still a way off, and uh, if he manages to win and really can achieve that, what he had just what he said, uh, he said often that he will stop the war in 24 four hours, even if he takes 24 days, that would be exciting, wouldn't they? Yes, indeed. Uh, what, what, what will be more exciting for the Ukrainians is how they're conducting this counteroffensive. It seems it's going uh, the Ukrainians' way, uh, possibly not as quickly, as fast as they want it to go. Uh, but you can't count the Russians out. It, it also seems that the Russians have not lost any further territory apart from the eight villages that Ukraine say that they've recovered uh, in, the next, in the last few days. What's your, uh, your view on their counteroffensive and how far they can take this to the point of pushing the Russians back? Well, I've watched quite a number of comments about the specifics of the, 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 the battle, and uh, um, they are making some progress. Of course, the, the Russian uh, team, of course, they are not, uh, they, they're not lying low, they are not they have not been uh, scared to the point of uh, retreating, which is really the only thing that matters. So that, that is it. And either way, whether, whether the counter-offensive is, uh, is working, definitely it's not working that um, well, you know, the, the way we, we, we want it to work, to see to, to the end of the war, it hasn't got to that point yet. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that's an ongoing thing. But sadly, again, it is war. Uh, it's war. It just tells us the war isn't ending. In, indeed. Here are, finally, here are two names that I think... Uh, will elicit a smile from Vladimir Zelensky and a frown from President Putin, Ursula von der Leyen of the EU and John Stoltenberg of NATO. Mm -hmm. And we saw earlier in the program uh, them speaking up, ramping up more aid for Ukraine. That is the EU. It seems as, as far as support, the European Union has played to the gallery and has helped Ukraine as far as it can, and it continues to do so. Uh, finally, in your submission, if it goes, which, whichever way the war goes, has the West done its best to help Ukraine? Uh, yeah, sorry, it, 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 I didn't get you now. Okay, I was saying that has the support that has come from the European Union and NATO been all they can muster so far to help Ukraine? And at the end, of the day, it depends on Ukraine on what they make of this support. Well, um, the, 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 the West, the uh, EU especially, and of course uh, uh, the, the NATO, which includes uh, uh, the US, they've put in quite a lot of resources, yeah. but it, it, it definitely, it, it, it's evident that this war uh, is a war against a formidable enemy and that there's a lot of a lot more resource that is needed. There is it's an unending demand, the expect requirement for to conduct this war. They are looking for the F-16 uh, fighters to be, to secure their air air cover. 
they are not getting it right away. They may in future, but it all means that the, this in, the incremental slow support uh, seem to make the war long last longer. Of course, this is agreeable. Mm. Maybe if they had been able to get a lot more and uh, prosecute the war the way they would have wanted to, perhaps uh, it would have uh, it would but it will send the right call, the right message to put it, to withdraw or call it off. But it's not happening. So for the reasons that they have given, they don't want to escalate the war. But the war is already escalated. It's there. It's not ending. They're talking about counter-offensive and offensive. So something really must change. We hope that change comes very soon. Thank you so much for your insight, Ambassador former ambassador to Switzerland of Nigeria, Nigeria's former ambassador to Switzerland, that is Ambassador Joseph Ayalogu. Thank you for your contribution this morning. Thank you. On to you. Still ahead. The Kremlin says Russia's President Vladimir Putin and African delegation discuss importance of Russian grain supplies to the continent. Please stay with us. Welcome back to a second half of our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. The country's third assault brigade released footage on Monday. It, show, it says shows its soldiers moving under fire to man their trenches during fighting near Bakhmut. Now, Britain's Ministry of Defense said that over the last 10 days, Russia has likely started relocating elements of its Dnipro group of forces from the eastern bank of the Dnipro to reinforce the Saporizhia and the Bakhmut sectors. At least 21 people are dead and 28 others were injured following the Nova Kakovka Dam collapse earlier this month in the Kherson region. This is according to the Minister of Ukraine's Internal Affairs accounts. At least five of those killed were injured by Russian attacks during the dam evacuations, according to Ihor Klimenko, speaking via telegram on Tuesday. Russia and Ukraine continue to point fingers as to who was responsible for the dam collapse. Ukrainians estimate the cost of damage to be about 1.5 billion euros. Russian President Vladimir Putin and visiting African leaders discussed the importance of Russian grain supplies to the continent at the weekend talks in St. Petersburg. Now speaking to reporters, the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the importance was underlined of grain deliveries, especially Russian grain, to the African continent, to the poorest countries. Peskov also said that Russia sees scant chance of peace with Ukraine due to Kyiv's stance on the issue, despite constructive efforts by the African peace mission. In his words, Russian President Vladimir Putin had held very productive talks with African leaders on Saturday and remains open to dialogue and contacts on Ukraine. He warned reporters that what he called the history of Kyiv's position meant one can hardly talk about stable grounds for peace negotiations. Now we're glad to speak with national security risk strategist and former British police officer, Mr. Vince Yekwelu, who's speaking to us from Abuja, the federal capital territory today. Thank you for making out the time to be with us. Good morning, thank you. Good morning. Now, should we start from the... Um, bomb shelters it must have been horrific for as we we're reporting in our first story for people escaping from a war situation and from drone attacks and what have you rushing to a bomb a bomb shelter to find that it cannot open 
Now it's underground, it can't open. Because of that, they were killed. And because of that, the Ukrainian president had to uh, take uh, punitive measures on the official responsible. Is Ukraine losing sight of the fact that it has to also, as it's stocking up on weapons and training its soldiers, also have to have infrastructure by way of bomb shelters ready to go uh, to help to aid the safety of its citizens? Honestly, uh, you're absolutely correct. In this kind of situation that is going on, the war in Ukraine, you can never play with the accessibility of bomb shelters because it's believed across, even if you go to countries like Israel, once the alarm goes up, people have been directed on where to go to get to safety under a bomb shelter. But you have to appreciate that Ukraine is facing some unique challenges uh, in the sense that most of the bomb shelters are also being used to store arms. And obviously, they are having to make a difficult choice about the bomb shelters that are readily available uh, for Ukrainians to use when the bomb alarms goes up. And also, it's also failure of the administration because you're supposed to do what, it do, what you call a test run. These bomb shelters are supposed to be test run at least once every week to make sure that everything is, is well, everything is in operational. So I think it calls for the Ukraine administration to kind of protect more of the lives of Ukrainians because it's part of the war propaganda. It's very poorly uh, for them to rush the bomb shelters without having accessibility leading to death. There's another thing that you, you raised that I want to point out about the propaganda. I call it propaganda that most of the grains being exported out of Ukraine and Russia are being sent to Africa. Uh, be aware that statistics has it that only about 3% of the grains, wheat or corn, that's been sent out of Ukraine and Russia has gone to Africa. So that means the other 97% has gone elsewhere. But unfortunately, the image of the African malnourished child or impoverished child makes more, is more attractive when posted on internet because mm. there's this propaganda that makes Africans suitable to be called malnourished or to be called starving. So if African nations are actually starving, how come only 3% of the grains exported out of Russia and Ukraine being sent to Africa where has the 97% of the grain gone? So what it means that in a war situation like this, there is so many dynamics, there is so many propaganda. You know, we talked about propaganda the last time I was here with you. Yes. So that means there's, there's nations across the world that are practically more impoverished than African nations, but African nations shoot the propaganda that they are the ones that are more stabbing. And in conclusion, African leaders should look at themselves in the mirror. Why can't you grow your corn? Why can't you grow your wheat? Why can't you grow your millet? Is it like African soil are not fertile enough? So I think this war in Ukraine is a challenging call to African leaders to learn to be more sustainable with your food security. You do not have to rely on Ukrainians to send you corn. You do not have to rely on Russians to send you wheat. You can practice mechanized agriculture and grow your own basic crops that helps your, your country people to be secured with their food security. Thank you. You raised some interesting points there. Aside from the grain, uh, you also mentioned something I didn't know. You said that uh, possibly some of the bomb shelters were being used to store arms. That's news to me. That, that, will, that will be a, a crime of some sort, right? But the Ukrainians will be covering that up if they're the ones doing that. But what, 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 what possible, good, possible good will it serve for them to use bomb shelters to store weapons of any sort? Uh, you have to understand that during the USSR regime, that Ukraine was well fortified with loads of bomb shelters. Uh, Ukraine has loads of uh, fortification with, with bomb shelters that helps them. It's part of the USSR military regime uh, 
protection back in the days. So basically, most of the bomb shelters in Ukraine can be used to protect human lives, correct? And yeah. when you have munitions that have been exported to you, you have to also look for a protective custody that is basically well fortified, that can take care of all these munitions because of their vulnerability to, to fire, to uh, missile attacks. Obviously, last week we had a rumor, which has not been confirmed, that Mr. Budunov, who happens to be the Ukraine intelligence chief, uh, was killed with some NATO officials. As I said, it's not been confirmed, but uh, we are still requesting to see his current picture uh, because what we are seeing so far has been his old picture. And where was he killed based on the unconfirmed information? It was an underground uh, sh bomb shelter that, it, that was covered with a fake stream. So it was an underground bomb shelter covered with like a mini lake, a man-made lake. But for some reason, the Russians, being part of the USSR, had intel about almost all the bomb shelters that exist in Ukraine. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. So it was successfully bombed. But as I say, it's an unconfirmed information. So bomb shelters, wow. yes, are important for humans, but also important for storage of munitions. Very interesting, uh, Mr. Yekweli. We hope that, that the more light is shed on that particular issue. I wish we had more time, but finally, uh, the dislodgement of mines as a result of the inundation of the landmass because of the destruction of the Kakovka Dam, they say, the Ukrainians that is, that can result in the washing up of these mines on the shores of other countries. Now that's a scary proposition. What can be done, if anything at all? Yes, it's, it's wrong. It's ethically wrong. It's professionally wrong for mines to be used in current warfare. There has been an international treaty to stop the usage of mines because once you lay this mine, it's quite difficult for you to identify mm. all the mines that you've laid. If you've laid 1,000 mines, for you to identify the 1,000 will be difficult mm. because at times it moves with the earth's surface. During flooding, it may relocate from one point to another point. And as you rightly said, maybe get into the uh, world uh, water bodies and go to other nations. Children, we pick them up, play with them, not knowing what they are. So I think uh, the Russian authorities um, need to be very careful because it's now going beyond what we are expect from them. But in conclusion, sir, there's something that happened very recently. There are statistics from the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine saying that over 55% multinational companies operating in Ukraine have lost income from their sales. They also went to say that about 33% of multinational companies in Ukraine have had a staff or more staff killed in this war. They also went to say that about 23% of companies working in Ukraine have got staff injured while at work or going to work or coming back from work or even doing social affairs. So I think the statistics okay. are worrying, showing that Ukraine needs more help, more support from the world to, uh, to stop this effect of the war. Thank you. Indeed. Indeed. If this you've just mentioned is confirmed to be accurate, then another cause for worry. Thank you so much, Mr. Vince Oyekwelu, National Security Risk Strategist and a former British police, police officer for your input this morning. Thank you for having me. Now, a Russian soldier who destroyed a German-made leopard tank in a battle in Ukraine has been given one million rubles as a reward. That's equivalent to $11,000 uh, by a private foundation. It published a video showing the soldier, whose name is Andriy Kravstov, sitting on a hospital bed and receiving a reward certificate from Alexander Karolin, a three-time Olympic champion in Greco-Roman wrestling. The ministry did not say when and where Kravstov had destroyed the tank or what he was being treated for in hospital. In the video, he appeared to be missing his right hand. Russia says its forces have destroyed a number of German-made Leopard tanks and U.S.-supplied Bradley fighting vehicles since Ukraine launched a counteroffensive earlier this month. The Defense Ministry last week said it had paid 
individual bonuses to more than 10,000 Russian servicemen since the start of the conflict in Ukraine for destroying or capturing Ukrainian or Western supplied hardware. It says the rate was 100,000 rubles for a tank and 300,000 rubles for a plane. Handing over the certificate for the private bonus, Karelin told the soldier, these are wonderful additional payments for those who cause significant damage to the enemy, on top of what the state is doing. The bonus is paid from a fund established by a private group of entrepreneurs, an example of how some Russian businessmen are seeking ways to publicly display the loyalty to the Kremlin's military campaign in Ukraine. That's where we leave it for today's coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alumide Macaulay. Do have a good day and join us again tomorrow.